All right. Hello, everybody. We are back for another Telescope Talk Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space. Oh, did you see how my voice just dropped there? I went like DeepAstronomy.Space. And today we are bringing back a some of my some of our good friends that started out the uh, Telescope Talk Hangout series, my friends from the UK and Germany. We have people here to talk about just general stuff. Uh, without what we thought we'd do today is maybe kind of play with the format we had a while back, which is where we, uh, you know, each sort of take a little bit about 10 minutes or so talk about something that's important for us in astronomy. And, uh, we're going to do that today. I call it an astronomy round table. And we're also going to be, I'm also going to be taking questions and comments from the chat here, uh, as they appear. I've already seen a good one here from Sean Hawkins. So I'm going to read that one out in just a little bit. It's been a busy year here at Deep Astronomy. A lot of cool things have happened. A lot of things have changed. I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, when it when it gets to be my turn. Uh, but um, I want to remind everybody that we are we do this every Wednesday. Telescope talks a little bit strange in the sense that it started out being an amateur astronomy discussion, and then. I got the idea that I'd like to talk about ground-based astronomy with professional astronomers, but I didn't know what to call it, so I called it Telescope Talk Pro, and then I made this one Telescope Talk Amateur, and then we thought, well, okay, uh, we'll just alternate weeks, because there's not enough content to, you know, really satisfy two full hangouts of of uh, of these, and turned out I was wrong because as I started scheduling the pro hangouts, they started stepping on the amateur hangouts and, and it was just like, and plus if I moved, I moved it from Wednesday to Tuesday and that wasn't good for Alex, one of the guys that's here today. So we moved, so we had a lot of changes. So what we've settled on is telescope talk is now twice a week. It's sponsored by OPT telescope. So thank you guys very much. And the link to OPT telescopes, if you want to learn about more about what they're selling, the link is in the description box, please go visit them and you're supporting uh, Deep Astronomy's efforts by doing that because it is important uh, that we acknowledge, we, because without their support, we could not be here doing these hangouts. So I want to thank them for that. But the, uh, and so we had two, sort of a branch of two different hangout series. Uh, and now on Wednesdays, we do amateur hangouts, and on Tuesdays, we do professional hangouts. Now, you may be wondering, well, where was yesterday's hangout? Yesterday was supposed to be on the Giant Magellan Telescope, but they had a scheduling conflict last minute, told me about it yesterday, and they want to reschedule for January. However, next week, December 18th, I think, is the next Tuesday, whenever that is. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Event Horizon Telescope, and I know you want to check that out because that is the consortium of observatories around the world that are trying to image directly the event horizon of, of our scent of the black hole at the center of our galaxy Sagittarius a star so that's going to be next week so anyway that's kind of a, a, a little bit of a long preamble because I, I don't think I ever really explained what's going on with telescope talk hangouts so today we're doing the amateur version and sometimes we have opt staff on sometimes we don't sometimes we have uh, other amateurs uh, who want to be a part of the the hangout if you want to be a part of this hangout all you got to do is go to deepastronomy.space slash hangouts and fill out the little form there and say, yeah, I want to be in a hangout and here's what I'd like it to be about. And we will talk about it and see if we could put you on a schedule. So anyway, uh, hi Galaxia. It's good to see you. Welcome everybody. Um, and Hans Milling is here and Alex Rangers, what are you doing chatting on the thing? You're in the hangout. All right, let me bring out my, my round table. Here we are. Here's everybody. So right below me is Alexander Rangers, who obviously can't wait to get started on the chats. And he's, oh, John and Peter, you're all doing it. Will you pay attention? You're in the Hangout. Pay attention. <laughs> uh, welcome, guys. It's been a while since I've seen you. Uh, Adam was also supposed to be here, but I don't know where he went. So we're just starting without him. My uh, my guess is that he is, he's busy with other things. He gets called on things last minute a lot so anyway we wish you were here adam but we understand why you can't be here right next to me over i knew i'd do that wrong over here is john suffle he is uh he is an amateur astronomer from the united kingdom uh in fact so is the guy below him peter quinn he's from newcastle my old my well not my it's not my stopping grounds but it's my wife's stopping grounds and i 
I love it up there. So it's good to see you again, Peter. Welcome. And right below me is Alex Reinders. He's joining us from Germany. So I'm the American contingent. So we've covered the globe. No, we haven't. We've only covered Europe. UK and good America, landing. but we need, we need to do well, we're doing pretty good. I think on the international front. So that's pretty good. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's see, let, I want to get to some questions, ask us anything. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and, and we're going to, I'm going to start giving, I'm going to give the mic to these guys. Let then we're going to spend about a little bit of time, each one, uh, talking a little bit about what's important to them. And I think I'll start with John right here. Hey, John. Why don't you go ahead and Hello. what do you want to share with us today? Well, first of all, um, especially <laughs> people who have um, refracting telescopes and um, Casa grains, one problem um, that occurs is um, mold growing um, on the inside lens. It's something which is um, extremely difficult to get rid of. Now, you can buy um, desiccant um, eye caps, eyepiece caps. Um, they're not expensive, about between 30 and 50 pounds. Um, which if, if you've only got one telescope, it's not a lot of money. But if you're like me and you've got three or four, then um, it's going to start adding up the pennies. Well, I don't know about you, but I think 60 pounds is pretty expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Not now, desiccant, te uh, explain what desiccant, what you mean by that. What does desiccant uh, eyepieces um, do? Well, it's, um, you've all seen these little sachets when you built some electrical equipment. Mm -hmm. um, it's in the box. It keeps the um, moisture, uh, well, it absorbs the moisture in the box. And in the same way, the desic these desiccant caps, um, they've got uh, sachets like this in them. And they'll take the moisture out of the telescope itself. Um, like I say, between 30 and 50 pounds each. But there's an alternative, a very cheap alternative, especially if you've got some of these 35 millimeter um, canisters. Um, if you don't have any, you can buy them from Amazon or eBay, very cheap. And all you do, let me open it. You dig a hole through one through the um, bottom. If you can't see that, well, let's put a touch. You dig a hole through the um, bottom of the um, canister. You get a couple of small discount bags. These are the rechargeable ones. Um, they change colour when um, the when the um, silica gel is um, saturated. He's put them onto a radiator for two hours. They'll change back to the normal colour. Um, Are they not all uh, rechargeable? No, not all of them. Oh, really? I thought they were. Okay. So make sure you get the rechargeable ones and the ones that change colour. <clears throat> There's some that don't change colour, so it's going to get a bit cunning. Yes. Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, and you pop them into the canister, put the lid on, and very nicely, they fit into a one, um, one and a quarter inch um, eyepiece. And that keeps the moisture out of the optics of the star diagonal in that case? Uh, in this case, yeah, the yeah. diagonal. Um, obviously, it'll be on the end of the telescope. And that'll um, help to keep the um, the, the, um, yeah, the mirror of a casa grain. That's really good tip. of a refractor. Uh, fee from mold and fungus. That's a good so It's going to get expensive if you need to get uh, one of them cleaned. <clears throat> um, the second thing, last week, um, Nagler was talking about um, two-inch um, two eyepieces. Oh, and last week, you're talking about last week's telescope talking out? That's right, yeah. Oh, yeah okay. And we've, we've mentioned the um, two-inch eyepieces before. Uh, yeah. Now, as you know, I've got two telescopes, uh, sorry, four telescopes. Two of them can take two-inch eyepieces. The other two can't. So what you do if you want to use a two-inch eyepiece all the time? One solution 
This is made by um, Celestron. It's a two inch eyepiece, but it comes with a built in one and a quarter inch adapter. Do not try and take these off. <laughs> Why is that? They're not meant to come off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to break things if you do. Huh? Yes. <laughs> you surprised, John. Yeah, somebody did that on um, on a, in, on one of the astronomy forums. Um, he thought it was a bit stiff, so he got a spanner of all things. Yeah. And he broke the, um, this bit off. He could still use it as a two, two inch, but, it's, um, but he ruined it for one and a quarter. So that is always on there, on that two inch yeah, eyepiece? That, that is always on, yeah. Okay, that uh, does it affect the um, apparent field of view? No, not really. It's, it, this is um, seventy mil, yeah, seventy mil um, field of view. But um, and you know, so this the um, like I say, it's made by Slash on very good eyepieces. These, mm -hmm. yeah, they do a good job. And and um, this one cost me less than a hundred pounds. Uh, they're not too expensive, especially now that Christmas is coming around the corner. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, are you are you hinting <laughs> there? <John? laughs> but what do you do if you've got a, a two inch only eyepiece, and you'd like to use it on a telescope that can only take one and a quarter inch? Um, up until recently, you're kind of stuck. But now you can get one of these. It's a two inch, two one and a quarter inch adapter. Put the eyepiece in that end, tighten it up, and put the other piece into the um, diagonal. And there you go. And again, this doesn't affect the apparent field of view of the eyepiece. Nope. Okay. Wow. And how much are what? For, what do those things cost? This I bought for for the princely sum of ten pounds. Mm. That's cheaper than those desk and eyepieces. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, that's good. That's really good. Um, anything else, John, that you wanted to mention? Uh, that was it, really. Okay. For this, for this, for this meeting. Yeah. Um, so the, he, a couple things I just want to add to that, and that is that the, the climate matters. And I was, you know, I was, I've been doing some, one of the things I've been doing recently is talking, uh, uh, doing some how-to videos on a telescope that OPT sent me. And in fact, it's this one here, the, the five SE and the, um, the thing I noticed being in Florida versus having done most of my observe, observing in Colorado growing up where it's very dry is I didn't need any of that stuff. I didn't need desiccants. I didn't need, uh, I didn't need, uh, uh, do caps or any of that stuff to keep the moisture off the optics because there just wasn't that much in the air. That really is an issue down here in Florida, I've noticed. So these things like desiccant eyepieces, uh, do caps, they're little tiny, uh, heating elements for, you know, the uh, corrector plates or, or objective lenses on refractors, things like that to keep the dew and the, the moisture off of the end of your telescope. Turns out you really got to have that stuff because when I was out there looking at the Orion Nebula last week uh, with this telescope over here, uh, I noticed that the image was getting fainter and fainter. And as I looked out, sure enough, the the corrector plate was getting foggier. So stuff matters. This stuff's important, and it could be. Exp and it, it's a good use for what to do with those desiccant packets. Uh, they're they're just little nodules of silicon in there. Uh, some of it's gel, and it just absorbs moisture. Um, I thought all of them were rechargeable. <laughs> I've been like putting them all in the microwave thinking I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm making them better, but I guess I'm not. <laughs> one, one thing, um, I was talking about the refractors and, um, grains. If you've got a Newtonian, um, it, even better is to get a large bag of the silica gel and simply stick it to the, um, to the um, main oh, um, cap. You mean just in, in, the, in the lens cap or the objective cover that it most all or that all telescopes have? Um, you can just well, in, in stick it Newtonian. in there. Hmm? In the in the Newtonian, you can stick it onto the um, the lens the um, and the caps inside. Yeah, on the side of the cap at the front of the telescope. Okay. All right. Cool. 
Uh, since we're doing this in roundtable format, and I'm going to get to you next, Alex, but I want to let's go ahead and, and knock out a couple of questions real, real quick. Um, what's this one? Uh, Savvy Coops, uh, what is what is the best polar alignment app for the smartphone, free or purchasable? Do you guys know a polar alignment app? I don't use them. Sorry. Yeah. I use the scan control of my mount. It's okay. You use what control? Uh, on my SIN scan control from my mount, there's a polar alignment and it works. Repeat it two or three times and it's perfect. Yeah. Um, I guess, I guess my, I don't know about an app. Uh, but there are these things, there's a thing called a pole master, which you can buy. It's not very expensive. I'm going to do a how to on that in a little bit, but uh, a video on this, but what you do is you attach it to your telescope and you can do easy polar alignments with that as well. It's not easy, especially with the Cassegrain, uh, telescope to polar align, um, what, what for those of you who don't know what he's talking about is you want to if you're if you're not using your telescope in alt as mode which is something that if you are using a dobsonian or a telescope that um is just i should i should show you with this in just a minute but uh it, it well in fact i just will hold on just a sec ah uh, okay i've got something that might help here Oops. Uh, it's, uh, article. All right. This telescope is in out as mode. Let me get this out of the way. And if you look at the, so if the, if the, um, the, the base plate is, is, is parallel to the ground and the, this is the fork mount. It's pointing straight up and down. This is out as, okay. This is the, uh, declination <laughs> axis. And the azimuth axis is this way. Alternatively, you can use this in polar alignment mode where you're using it in equatorial mode like this. And this now becomes the axis that needs to be pointing at the pole star. But this is hard to do. This is it's hard to get it, it it's hard to get it to point straight to the North Star. So how do you do it? And there's lots of different techniques. There's lots of apps, I guess. I don't know of any apps, but there is something called a pole master, which I would, I would ask you to check into, which simplifies the process. I don't have time to go into it here, but the, uh, I will do a video on it. And, uh, it has the ability to get this perfectly lined up to the North star. And that's what you're trying to do in out as mode. You don't care. It's just pointing straight up. So that's, um, uh, that's, that's the difference there. Okay. Alex. I could dance mentioned the polar alignment or SynScan app for Android. SynScan 2.1 for polar alignment. Say that again, please. I didn't hear you. There's a SynScan app from Skywatcher for Android phones. And you could use this for polar alignment, Michael Densler said. Oh, okay. Um yeah, I don't know anything. <laughs> Lol, Tony with his telescope. Hey, don't make fun of me, Galaxia. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Alex, okay. You want to go? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I thought about making a little summary, an astronomical summary of 2018. Astronomically, we had perfect weather, almost perfect, almost no rainfalls, was it was a bit threatening, I think. And well, we had no rain in South Germany from April to October. It got very dry. And well, I found some images from European Space Agency where you can see it was Europe, right on the left, and Germany on the right. And it was in June, and this was on July. This is showing the cloud cover? Cloud cover and the dryness. Everything is brown. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Wow, look at that difference. July 25, June 28. So this was, these were the skies over Germany, or the, the conditions over Germany. 
uh, during yes, last we summer. Had no rains, but sometimes very dusty, but always busy for, in astronomy. Yeah, every weekend almost. So you're and, saying this was a good thing for amateur astronomers, but it doesn't look yes. like a good thing for anybody else. I've never been that busy before in a year before. Yeah. All right. Wow. Yeah, it's been, uh, uh, here in Florida, we had quite a bit of rainfall. So it was, uh, it was, I think a little bit above average here, but we did miss a hurricane. Well, no, we didn't. Uh, I missed a hurricane, but, uh, North Florida didn't. Well, okay. So this was the, so you've, uh, this was the weather condition. So you're saying now you had back in September, a really big star party too, didn't you? Yes. But let me start with in April. Oh, I all right. Go ahead. Visiting the Sky Park in the Swabian Alps. But, uh, meeting some astronomers, sharing the hobby, sharing the experience. And I did the time lapse of it. And it was quite fun. Meeting new people, making new experiences, is always interesting in astronomy. This was in April? It was in April, yes. Right, very early in April. Nice time. That was the DSLR for 50 Canon. It's called Rebel XI in the United States, I think. It's just using a tree tripod and doing some 30 seconds exposures. And this is the result. And I think it's quite funny for several hours. How did you take that? Just using my DSLR and a fisheye lens. And I was using that on a tripod and making 30 seconds exposures. What was the uh, ISO uh, rating setting on the on the camera? It was ISO 1600, uh -huh. and field of view was 160 degrees <coughs> on a PNC format. And so, I'm sorry, you said the exposure time was 30 seconds, or was that the inter interval? It was 30 seconds exposures. Okay. That's very nice. That's very nice. I love the wide field of view. Uh, well, what did we have next year? The lunar eclipse in 2018. That's right. I think you couldn't say them in the United States that good as we could. So it was South Germany. I wanted to be alone, but suddenly... <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I almost missed the start of the eclipse. I was using two cams... One 200 millimeter lens, and this is the fish eye again. And our kids are running around, had very much fun seeing a telescope equipment, moon and Mars rising. Ah, uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, I saw Mars a few times. It's a close view with 200 millimeter lens. I was changing, moon is moving, you see it on the star. It was quite some hours fun with parents and kids and explaining them what the what these clouds in the sky are. This this was the Milky Way. I've never seen the Milky Way before. Wow. So how far are you from the nearest uh, city or town? Well, actually, I'm in the town. Really? And you can see the Milky Way? That, it's not a big town. You know, it's about uh, roughly 30, 40,000 people. I'm, well, not in the center. I'm, yes, and, and a bit outside. And this is a place about 40 kilometers away from my home dark place and it's very good to watch or view the sky at night the dark sky wow that's really nice and in mid of august new moon and the purse eats I just catched one of my time lapse it was the same if you want to catch some meteors they go down where the camera doesn't look at so the yeah there's one frame where you had a really nice one right Yes. There it is. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty. What's the what's the frame? What what's up with the framing on this? Why is there two? Are you in between two buildings or what's up with that? 
How were? Uh, this is uh, out of some trees. It was in the forest. Yeah. And I was looking out of the trees, and uh, yeah, the I wanted to get as much sky as possible, and was not the horizontal format; it was the vertical format, and so used my fish eye in, in the vertical position. Oh, that's why it's so strange aspect ratio. Yes. I it's see. like a smartphone, but oh, okay. with the DSLR. It does look like a smartphone. And this is a star party. It's a timeless star party. We were quite successful. More than 100 visitors, 40 astronomers, amateur astronomers, 60 telescopes. It was the second day starting in the morning and yeah the, the field got busy <clears throat> after a while many cars many people and was the most effective was to use the local newspaper to make an outreach i always thought that kids wouldn't read newspapers anymore but use the newspaper or the local new newspaper apps finding that place and so they came you advertised in the newspaper yes local newspaper was very effective oh, that's good yeah know. i like local newspaper posts to facebook all the time so i'm not really surprised so what's the total cumulative time of this time lapse you started in the morning and then went all night yeah Oh, I stopped at two o'clock at night, I think. <laughs> it was a uh, somebody walking around with a flashlight or something. So how many people showed up at the star party? Dear, this is a view from Christian. He's also on the YouTube chat right now, and I'm very proud to show you, you ah. his video and <laughs> did uh, lots of lots of cars there and lots of people and we're very proud of that. That is a lot of that's a good thing. Thank you, Christian, so much for sharing is here and it was very great to get that video look at all those people so this is what a star party is like folks they are yeah. very um very l l con what's the word i'm looking for convenient or congenial events uh yeah. everybody here is very friendly they 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 have some people have amazing very they'll see you'll see various grades of equipment and and uh, different kinds of equipment out there it's a good place to get an idea what kind of things you'd like to get yourself, or if you can't afford it, just use somebody else's. Like right here in this frame, look at that Dobsonian off to the left. This is mine. That's <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. Alex's. And uh, tell us a little bit about that. Inch that was in the smart car. That's the one you fit in the smart car. That's right. Yes. Uh, so that breaks yeah. down. Yeah. I was so proud of so many people coming this time. The year before we had bad weather and about yeah, 30 visitors, but this time it was very good. We had presentations from the Stuttgart Observatory, from Andreas Ebel, he is the boss of the Observatory of Stuttgart, and he did a presentation about how amateurs can contribute to professional research by observing and uh, documenting occultations, star occultations. It was very, very interesting. He had a presentation for about two hours. Nobody left before he was he he, he finished. So it was very, very interesting. What size? What, what? Back to Stuttgart, real quick. What's the size of the the uh, telescope they have at, at that observatory? They have a bunch of. They have. Oh, they have um, a lot. Okay. Yeah, they have uh, also the American telescope. Yeah, the oldest one, freshly restored, is a seven inch size refractor. It's a Fraunhofer, it's a two lens. But they also have a Lund 100 millimeter in <clears> diameter <throat> and um, Starfire eight inch or seven inch refractors. Wow. And they do a very, very professional job there also with these bad city conditions. They're very, very professional, although they are just a club. The, uh, the Stuttgart local. Observatory is a club? It's actually a club, but it's it's a kind of institution of Stuttgart, you know. They're proud of it and can be proud of it. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to know a little bit more about that observatory. Okay. What do we have? So, watch the view of the field of the Rod Star Party, people sharing the telescopes. 
before you buy, you have to come to our star party. Then you can see what you get or what you like or what you wouldn't like. That's the best thing about them, folks. It really is. Yes. Well, there's a lot of things good about it. That's it for the star party. And it's on imaging too. Uh, one was asking about Vertanen. I did this image yesterday. Surprisingly, the, it got the clear weather at night, but it was very uh, freezy. So this is with, taken with a 200 millimeter lens, SLR, uh, 60 second exposure, one minute at ISO 3200, I think. And this was when? Riding with a little mount. Yeah. This was when? When did you take this? Yesterday. Last night. Yesterday okay. At 2200. So this is up now, folks. It's uh, about well ten o'clock in the evening, right in the south, next to Taurus, and you can orientate it to the Aldebaran now and move to the right with a binocular, for example, as this one, and you might see there a large cloud. It's about three times of the moon. So with a telescope, you're not effective, very effective with imaging. So using a lens, it was a 200 millimeter lens, you get the whole comet into one picture. Is, is Taurus in the field there? I don't see it. Not yet, but tonight, I think, he is now moving to Taurus. Okay, so for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere in the North America, this will rise, this will be up about 8 or, or, I'm sorry, about 9 or 10 p.m. local time, eastern time, I should say. It'll start to rise above the trees, and you can start to see this. And you said you saw yeah. it 10, 10 o'clock Central European time? Yes. Okay. It's 10 o'clock. Also oh. in, the United, in the United States. This is the Needle Galaxy, a wide field image, and this is the Virgo cluster. It was in spring. Otis galaxies M82 and 81. Get to nice. my favorites then. Yeah. It took about 26 exposures each with 10 minutes and in, at ISO 400. How many exposures each? I'm sorry. 26. 26? Exposures each 10 minutes exposure. So 260 minutes. Yep. This is 300 minutes it's to m the the sunflower galaxy m 63 this is a wide field of the milky way you know this is the signals lyra and there's the eagle constellation this is the north american nebula this is the center of the signals and yeah you see those hydrogen Clouds and it's very interesting to see compared dark clouds with the stars and uh, hydrogen fields. This is, I don't know if you can see this, I will zoom a bit in. This is a very faint planetary nebula that's Abel 39. Look at that. That's really hard to photograph or to image. That's really it, good. Look, 30 times 50 minute exposure with ESO 400. 30, 50 minute exposures? 15 minutes. Oh, 15, yeah. sorry. Exposure and 30 exposures I added to one picture. Okay. Get all this light. Very faint one, but it's a very nice one. Very, very round mm -hmm. in shape. Yeah, that looks fake, you know, when you look at it for the, uh, yeah. it looks like it's not, it's artificial. This is Jones 1. It's also a very faint planetary nebula. It's in the Pegasus constellation. And oh, this is a moon set with a 200 millimeter lens. And in the morning, at something about seven hours in the morning. This is the Iris Nebula and the Gold Nebula. It was in 20 times 20 minute exposures at ISO 400. <laughs> And actually, it was two nights. The Iris Nebula I took one night to take the Iris Nebula and one night for the the Ghost Nebula at the bottom. bottom. Just yeah, a closer view to the Iris Nebula. 
And this is the bubble nebula, white field. And this is the Orion constellation. It's actually at for winter. See the Barnard's loop here, the Horsehead Nebula and the Orion Nebula. This uh, used with uh, or taken with a 50 millimeter lens. So, so those are the kinds of lenses that come with your telescope, folks. So if you buy or your camera. So if you bought a, most of them anyway, come with a 50 millimeter lens. Mm -hmm. That's gorgeous, man. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love Barnard's loop. That's at, it's at, all of that is a big hydrogen alpha uh, cloud that is just spectacular. Really good job. A lot of dynamic range in there too. You can see the brightness of the yeah. Orion Nebula almost saturated. Well, it kind of is saturated and the, uh, the wispy nebulosity out in the background. That is a big wide field image, folks. That's the entire constellation of Orion. And that was my year, 2018. That was your year, 2018. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. That's really good. Uh, so, yeah, it's been, um, I don't know, for for a lot of, you know, a lot of things have been happening this year. We And then, of course, in 2017, we had a uh, solar eclipse. It was a big deal. So every year is a little bit different. I'm going to do a stream. I think in a couple of weeks, maybe with Carol, maybe not, uh, where we talk about some of the big, uh, 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 the big astronomical discoveries that, for 2018 as well. And, uh, we'll sort of do a recap on that. Um, is there any questions that you guys ran across in the, uh, chat we want to do? There was one. Oh, um, oh, here's a good one. I, I wanted to ask Neil's question. I saw a video on 3d printing most parts of a Dobsonian. Is that realistic? You guys have any comments? Then I'll give you mine. Three three D printing a Dobsonian telescope. Thoughts for small parts, yes. For large parts, no. It's much too expensive and not worth the effort. Yeah, it depends on. There are different kind of three D printers, though, aren't there? They they use different uh, stuff. I don't. The stuff I've seen was uh, there was a three D printer in Carol's office that had uh, uh, it used kind of a waxy plastic stuff and. It, while it seemed rigid and and would make good small parts, I don't know that it would make large parts. Besides, yeah, Alex is right. The the cost of printing a large, like, turntable sized bit piece would probably be too much for now, at least. Um, and you're better off just using wood, or something like that. Uh, but it is it is possible you can do it, especially the uh, the the parts that hold maybe the 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 mirror or the uh, the spider mount things like that. So. Uh, and for small adapters, it's interesting. It's an interesting uh, procedure, but for maybe for the bars, you know, for the Dobsonian, they are not that stable and not that solid. And using metal is much better. Yes. And uh, Anthroparian Tony lost you on Hubble Hangouts. So chuffed to have found you uh, the other day. Well, yes, welcome back. I'm glad you found us. Boy, Hubble Hangouts that was a long time ago, <laughs> and that was uh, that was like 2013, I think we were doing those. So yeah, welcome. We are streaming all the time now, three days a week uh, usually. So welcome back. I'm glad you were. I'm glad you're able to find us. Okay. Well, I don't see any questions right now. So I'll, if you've got any. Please leave us some, and I'll get to them here as soon as Peter tells us. He's, he, now, you wanted to talk about a news story that you found, right, Peter? Yeah. Um, and could you post that link in the chat? Or do you have the uh, – uh, I think I, I made you. This. Yeah. No, I'm sure a lot of you may have seen uh, the article regarding China's proposed second moon artificial uh, second moon. Um, it, they want to launch it into space to provide nighttime light to the city of Chengdu. Uh, eight times as bright as Earth's moon. Uh, it's technically called an illumination satellite meant to complement Earth's moon. And they've scheduled a launch or around 2020. And they say it wouldn't disturb the Earth's atmosphere or other celestial observations. Now, I'm sure that we all have major qualms about this and we don't really want to turn it into a, 
into a ranty type complaints, you know, um, at, at the Chinese or the satellite company individually. But uh, how how would you guys feel if this was happening here? Yeah. Yeah, so I I've only just seen this story. I didn't I didn't see much about it. Uh, Peter put a link to it in the chat box, guys. So if you want to pull it up on your browser, go ahead. Uh, this idea of China launching a satellite that will light up the uh, night sky doesn't sound to me to be a great idea. I'm not too thrilled about this. Uh, an artificial moon, presumably, it will reflect the light from the sun. Is that what is that what it's going to do, Peter? I think, um, it, think so, yes. So it's going to be in orbit. It will reflect light down. Uh, and they're saying that it'll be as eight times as bright as the full moon with a diameter, a dust that could cover an area on Earth close to 50 miles. So <laughs> they want to light up a city uh, f in China for some reason. Uh, the name of the, uh, I guess... I guess they want to be able to point and shoot the satellite at a city and lighten it up during the evening. Presumably, I guess the thinking is that saves money on night lights and street lights and things like that. Is that would that be the reason you think they'd want to do that? This is a demonstration of power, nothing but nothing else. That I think you're right. I I mean I think this is just a look what we can do kind of thing, and it would be highly annoying to as far as an amateur since this is an amateur astronomy hangout. <laughs> I don't think any of us are big fans of this. We want darker skies, not not brighter ones. Um, remember how There's mad people got to animals and and to, to people. Yeah, what was we the name? What? We need the nights. It's also doing harm <laughs> to the animals, yeah. to, to the environment, yeah. nature. I know. It's all of those are good points. I but yeah, we'll send animals time clocks off, off skew. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, completely off. Well, they get skew. That's just local dialect. Uh, but it will send animals timekeeping off. Yeah, the biorhythms and stuff. Well, I remember, I mean, I don't, first of all, I think this, I think Alex, you're right. I think this is a thing that they're doing just to show they can do it. But remember how mad people got when they, somebody launched this reflective satellite. All it was, was this thing that people could see from the ground and it flashed periodically and, and astronomers got up in arms over that because they're like, what are you doing up here? You're messing up. You know, you're just, you're it's like, a, it was like a disco ball or something like that. It was a highly reflective sphere that they launched. Star, yeah. yeah, that was it. That was it. And remember how angry people got, I can't imagine this, uh, being a well-received, uh, satellite up in space. Um, it would just, no. I don't know. It just get in the way, but you know what I think? I think we're going to see a lot more of this kind of thing going forward. We've got, this treaty that all the major powers in the world, all the countries have become a part of as far as how to approach space. You know, nobody owns it. Nobody can claim it. Uh, and, and the only, if you launch something into space, then it's your sovereign property, but that's it. You know, if you land something on the moon, you can't just claim that area of the moon uh, or, you know, an asteroid or something like that. So there's going to be a time, I think, where this is going to have to be revisited because people are just going to start doing whatever they want. It's kind of like a national park. We, in the United States, we have these national park systems where the government owns these vast, some of the most beautiful land we have, and they control it, and they try to, you know, uh, uh, control what goes on it. But, you know, everybody feels like, you know, they own they, this taxpayer land. And so they kind of think they can do whatever they want on it. And many people we do. The same here, um, but the, the royal family owns all of our national parks. So, and and so you've got a similar thing there in England. And so, um, I don't know. I think I think this is going to be a, a crisis point in space. Imagine, you know, people are just going to say, "Well, you can't tell me what to do." I mean, okay, so weapons in space, there are direct clauses in the space treaty about that, but you know. As far as what you can do up there, people can just just launch stuff and do things, and they're doing it, you know, already. That reflective disco ball thing really irritated a lot of people, uh, and it was just there because they could do it. And now 
with Elon Musk and with SpaceX and commercial ventures having easier and easier and cheaper access to space, I think this is going to be a problem. But Tony, like, there's so much space junk, it wouldn't stand that long. Right, which is a different problem, though, isn't it? I mean, if, if you... What's that thing called where if one satellite hits another satellite and then you get this big effect? It's called an, it's got an Tesla effect. Tesla syndrome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That, uh, that's going to be happening all the time. Right. And, uh, I don't, so space junk is slightly a different issue, but it's also going to be, it's also, well, it's a problem now. And some people are, you know, launching nets and trying to catch things. I think the UK did that. Somebody did that. So the artificial moon would get dimmed. Ned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I don't know. I've got mixed. I think this is a bad idea uh, for no other reason than we've already got enough problems with, with well, light pollution. Reading towards the bottom of the article, uh, I note that um, something similar has been attempted, attempted before. In 1983, 1993, Russia launched uh, illumination mechanism called a space mirror uh, in an effort to increase the length of the day. It used a giant sheet of plastic attached to a spacecraft to reflect sunlight back to the Earth. But for people on Earth, it looked just like the bright pulse of a star. Yeah, these things are, the engineering uh, is going to have to be on a much different scale, a mirror, one mirror, uh, you know, up in geosynchronous orbit is going to be, need to be huge to cover any kind of space on the ground. Now oh. this, this one is going to cover 50 square miles, apparently, or, if you could change or 50 the miles. Color to a more red light, that would be good for the people on the ground as well as not with astronomy much. I know, but it's for getting astronomy out of it for a minute, what's the reason for it? Why do you need... Is it so people can grow crops? And I mean, why do you want this? What's what's the reason for going through all the trouble to do this, other than maybe yeah. replacing well, street lights? Well, it's the only thing I can think of. I don't get Turn why the street you want lights it. Off and um, save money. Yeah. Yeah. James Dugan's commenting, there's a satellite that is proposed that will release pellets that become shooting stars for promotions and concerts. Oh, my God. Oh, good grief. Oh, my oh. God. <laughs> Those being polite. <laughs> uh, Hans Milling says, in the Alps, they have mirrors on the mountainsides to reflect sunlight into the valleys to prolong uh. the day. I guess I'm spoiled here in Florida. We have long days, even in the winter. Um, in the U.K., uh, I've been in the winter. You guys have four or five hour days. I get it. It sucks. You know, you, but you get all that nighttime, right? I mean, if you're an astronomer, that's awesome. But I, so I guess I, I can see it that you want to prolong the day, but it's not going to really work with, for like growing, growing seasons. You can't prolong a growing season. I don't think using this method. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> uh, and so, I mean, I don't know. Um, I just don't know why you do it. What's the point? Um, okay, well, okay, well, that's that's a that's an interesting story, Peter, and a little bit little bit sad. But uh, hopefully, China won't. Uh, now, China is doing some cool things. If they decide to launch this, okay, fine. But they're also going to the moon and doing a lot of other uh, really cool things that I think China. I'm I'm impressed with. I like China's space program. I think it's uh, an impressive one, or at least it's trying to be. <clears throat> and so is India. Uh, India also has a big um, space program. Uh, well, there can't be many up. astronomers in um, China if they're going to launch a bloody great big artificial moon. Launchpad astronomy. Remember the hours proposal. O U R S proposal. Bad idea. Glad it didn't happen. Have you guys heard of that? What is it? What is it? Uh, that's um, Christian Reddy, by the way, a launch pad astronomy. Uh, let's see. No, no, I do that. Oh, Hans Milling is asking you a question, uh, Alex. Did you see that? Do you use dark frames as well when stacking? Not anymore. I use dithering. A slightly movement of, of the picture, and then after stacking, you don't have this noise anymore. So... To me, it's a waste of time making darks. I can do it without it. So wait a minute. Some of your frames were 10 minutes long, right? 
and you low low um low sensibility low esos but very long exposures so you get much deeper into the sky and you have less noise and after that you doing several exposures uh, minimum is about 10 exposures and then you add them they are not in the same position as before they are slightly moved about 10 pixels in, in the square after adding you don't have that noise anymore you just have the features uh, the, the, the objects stars okay. added so you, you move the camera slightly between frames yes. that's right yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry, I you did say what was the exposure time that you did this on? That you do this on? Any? Ten minutes or twenty or also thirty minutes and low low ESOs up to four hundred ESO for uh, long exposures. Oh four you go down to four hundred, I see. Yeah. Okay. So dark current is for the I I'm, I'm just going back to trying to find things for people who may be watching this and don't know what we're talking about. Dark current is the noise that builds up. That is the thermal noise of a of a camera chip. So if you've got a sensor like a CCD or a CMOS uh, chip in a camera, and you open it to collect light, in other words, you push the button and hold it down, uh, it, it the shutter stays open. The CCD is active. It's collecting photons. The act when that's on the the chip builds up a noise uh, due to the just the heat uh, that's of the chip itself. There are two ways to get around it. One is to cool the chip uh, to keep it nice and cool. And another one is to um, and, and to take a, uh, so if you took a 10 minute exposure uh, of something and another way and you'd have the signal, the light from the object, whatever it is you're looking at, You'd also have the dark current, the dark uh, noise that's also accumulated. So to get rid of it, what used what a lot of people do is they'll close the lens cap, stop all light from entering the ca the camera, take a ten minute or whatever it is exposure of that, just darkness, and then you have a picture of your dark current. And what people used to, well one one way you can correct for it is to subtract uh, the dark current frame from your frame that you took before of the galaxy or the nebula or whatever it is and that subtracts out the the thermal current but i get there's a new way there's another way to get rid of it by moving the camera taking more and more pictures of the same thing and moving it around each time and when you add them up the dark current cancels out and it goes away and it 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 Re relieves the um, need for taking these dark frames. Does it work as good though, Alex? Yes, it works. It's huh? Perfect. I've you never tried it that way. Have a objects with it, exposures, and yeah. I don't use in darks anymore. I'm trying to visualize how it cancels out though. Just by moving the frame around and adding it up, how do you get rid of the dark current? <laughs> The math is that it just adds. Um, it's an additive noise, which is why to remove it, you subtract. Yeah. What is not at the next image, what is different, it won't be added. Oh, it adds the differences. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anything that's the same won't get. So that's, that is part of the software package that you use. Um, yes. Okay, good. Because just adding two images together doesn't cancel anything out. It just adds them up. So I, I, th I can see it now. So there, there are processing packages that when you add these things together and you dither, it will only add the things that are different in every single image, exactly. which is why you want to make sure you move it up. Because if you took two exact images of the same galaxy and try to do this, it would be, it would be black because they would be identical in both images. So you need to dither to make this work. I see. Okay. What's the name of the program? I'm using, I'm using Images Plus, mm -hmm. but you can also use a Deep Sky Stacker. Just depends on, yeah, on the guiding software you're using. I'm using the Auto Guider. It's the Lazata M Gen for okay. my DSLR, and it has, it has an ST4 connection to the mount, and it moves slightly. Yeah, using another cam, a guiding cam, and using a guiding star and moving the scar after one exposure to another point. Yes, you can do it square-wise, 
knights or snake wise just depends you've got different opportunities to use that guide either the mgen guider i like it okay well that's good advice uh, Jonas MH84, can anyone explain how to calculate the focal plane of a telescope, how big of a sensor you need to use with the telescope? The way I've always done it is I have used the aperture uh, of the um, telescope, the, uh, uh, the, the aperture of the objective, and the exit pupil of that um the the eggs there was a term for it and I'm, I'm 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 missing out when you don't have an eyepiece in the telescope there is a a plane there called it there's a word for it uh david nagler used it last week watch david nagler's uh hangout that we did last week he talks about that in there also we did a podcast with him uh, that I posted on Monday uh, on uh, the Space Junk podcast. He also talked about it there. But there is a ratio between the the objective lens and the exit pupil. It's not called the exit pupil. Exit though. pupil. Is it the exit pupil? Yes. It, uh, of the telescope. It's called an upbuild. Every lens makes an upbuild. It's an image. It's an portrait picture or portrait image out that for exact focal length. And you can calculate it with the exit pupil, I think. I see. Okay. I'm sorry I'm not doing a very good job uh, explaining that to you, but there <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, there there is a way to do it and um I'm going to I'm going to have to get out my my notes to figure out how we did it. But you most of the um uh the pixel scale of your camera, the the size of your camera and the exit pupil of that telescope is going to determine whether or not you have any vignetting and of course you're right in wanting to know what that pl that plane is so that you can properly match the uh the CCD with it. But fast telescopes uh tend to let you have really big uh, really big mirror or I'm sorry, chips on them whereas the uh uh slow telescopes, the ones with really long focal lengths um, you have a, you get vignetting um, with a lot of those. So with most wide field telescopes, or even ones long field telescopes that, that you use a telecompressor in, you're going to be fine with most with most cameras. But I don't know how to do it off the top of my head right now, so I'm sorry about that. Okay, um, okay, guys. Well, I guess we're going to stop there. We're out of time, and uh, I don't know. I hope let us know what you think. Did you like this format, guys? Do you want to see more stuff like this? Uh, we are going to. I'll be. These guys will be coming back periodically to, you know, help give us tips and and techniques for amateur astronomy. Uh, I want to, and of course, we'll also have people back from OPT telescopes as well as other people that I get uh, from the world of amateur astronomy to come and join us. So please let us know what you think. If you like this hangout, give us a thumbs up, uh, uh, share it with different people. And oh, wait a second, I have been streaming, and I did not even look. Um, at some of these oh tony prince you're on facebook it's good to see you i'm sorry i forgot to look um where was the here's where the comment was last night heading toward the pleiades uh he oh he posted on on uh, he posted on the comment section a youtube video of a time lapse of the comet uh last night using a c8 with hyperstar so um great so go check that out it's on he posted a link on facebook thank you uh for doing that uh, tony i appreciate that let me go look over at Twitch. Is anybody there? Oh, Tom Van Scotter, help. Hello, he's there. It's good to see you. <laughs> uh, I go through, I get so fixated on YouTube that I forget to go through all the different, uh, the, uh, the different platforms that we're on. So thank you for watching. Uh, Tom Van Scooter. Uh, is anybody on Periscope? You know, I never, Periscope's hard because all they do is give you like little followers and little hearts and stuff, but I don't get to see the, the comments so anyway okay so james dugan says more more software available for windows than operating systems uh than any other operating systems most free for astronomy that's true a lot of stuff for windows uh, although um stellarium works on everything and if you want to come and it'll control your telescope did you know that did you know stellarium controls your telescope it does I should do a hangout on that. All right, guys. <laughs> All right, Alex, Peter, uh, John, thank you so much for taking time out to talk to us about stuff on amateur astronomy. I want to thank all of you guys for watching, and we'll be back tomorrow. I will be talking with the authors of this book, 
Uh, explaining the universe explained a cosmic Q and a with, uh, Heather Cooper and Nigel Henbest. We're going to be talking about this book tomorrow at Astro coffee. So join us. Carol may or may not make it. She has laryngitis because she Ooh. just got over, um, she just got over bronchitis and her, the medicine gave her laryngitis. So she's not sure she'll make it tomorrow, but hopefully she can make it either way. I'll be here. So we'll talk to you then. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always keep looking up. <laughs> Good night. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>